Hey gang, this week's episode is brought to you by Bespoke Post and their must-have box of awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every month. No matter what you're into, Box of Awesome has you covered. From travel and outdoor gear to breezy summer styles and grooming goods, Box of Awesome has collections for every part of your life. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code GOODSEATS at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, code Good Seats for 20% off your first box. Now, here's our show. On to Soccer Bowl 77 in Portland, Oregon. The sellout crowd is partisan to the Seattle Sounders, but the Cosmos fans are demonstrative, cheering their team on in anticipation of one more victory. The expected defensive struggle turns out to be anything but that, as both teams display wide open attacks, resulting in frequent scoring opportunities. Goalkeepers Tony Chersky of the Sounders and Shep Messing of the Cosmos proved to be equal to every thrust early in the contest. Then, as so often occurs in games of this magnitude, a critical error turns the tide of play. Chersky dives at Steve Hunt's feet to break up a charge. Chersky seems in control, but for a moment, the goalkeeper loses his concentration, turning his back to Hunt and putting the ball on the ground. The ever-alert Hunt rushes in to scramble the ball into the net, tapping it over the line in spite of a desperate tackle by the startled keeper. Cosmos and their fans celebrate the unexpected goal while Chersky is left to reflect on the vital mistake. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hello, hello. How are you, my friends? It's your pal, Tim. And uh, we are back once again for another fun-filled episode of Good Seats Still Available. Yes, it's the curious little podcast devoted to what used to be in professional sports. My uh, sincere thanks for finding us and uh, downloading us, putting us in your earbuds, streaming us. However you're ingesting us this week, we appreciate it to no end. And uh, a treat for you, especially uh, if you fancy yourselves as uh, an old North American Soccer League fan, uh, and in particular, an old New York Cosmos fan. Yes, uh, we add to the pantheon of our uh, our guests and interviews uh, from some of the greatest uh, teams in North American Soccer League history. That is the being the New York Cosmos. Uh, and uh, we are delighted uh, and just um, wonderful to have the great Steve Hunt uh, with us here this week for a tremendous conversation of some great memories about some of the halcyon days of the old New York Cosmos soccer team in the NASL. He goes by Steve Evans now. I don't know if you knew that. And we get into that as we start our conversation in a few moments. Uh, he'll get into as to why that is the case. But uh, you will know him and remember him, of course, as at the time a 20-year-old phenom by the name of Steve Hunt. Uh, and in the New York metropolitan era, if you were following the Cosmos uh, in the uh, breakthrough 1977 season, as they were uh, entering their third uh, year in the Pele era, his final season, uh, and moving, making the big jump across the pond, uh, the pond of the river, Hudson River, that is, uh, to Giants Stadium, the um, uh, then gleaming new uh, structure in the middle of the New Jersey Meadowlands, 78,000 seats or so. Uh, the ambitions were big, and the Cosmos, and in 1977, not only grew into those ambitions, but uh, on many levels and on many occasions um, surpassed them, uh, as we'll get into some of those memories from that 1977 season. Yes, a championship season uh, for Pele as he uh, uh, bowed gracefully off of the North American uh, stage and frankly uh, uh, retired from his overall career as arguably, uh, if not the world's greatest player. 
a debate for other conversations for sure. But uh, in my mind, there is no debate uh, about the Black Pearl Pele as the uh, greatest uh, of all time to play the game. Uh, Steve Hunt, uh, though, a relative newcomer um, amongst a glowing or growing, I guess, glowing and growing, depending on on the time of day you watch them, um, a glittering assortment, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at, of stars and superstars and international superstars at that. Um, The collective of talent that was being assembled, I think, really kind of came together uh, in its uh, uh, almost supreme form in 1977. Yeah, there were glimpses of it, uh, say, with Giorgio Canaglia in 76, and uh, and then obviously Pele, who had shown shown up in, in 75 to, to great fanfare. Uh, but 1977 was the year that, uh, that Steve Hunt uh, not only came uh, aboard, along with uh, uh, other uh, great players from various parts of the world, but Franz Beckenbauer made his debut. Uh, in uh, in the New York area for the Cosmos, as well as the great Carlos Alberto, one of Pele's longtime teammates at Santos. Uh, so 77 uh, was sort of a, um, a, a somewhat of a storybook uh, year for this team. It, it would it kind of started with great expectations, great hopes and and uh, uh, definitely some some big shoes and seats to fill at the Giant Stadium. Um, but by the end, uh, what a capstone! What an exclamation point! And that clip that you heard really sort of puts it into into uh, into motion, and it's a great way to kind of set up our conversation with Steve Hunt. Um, talk about a phenom! Uh, I, I don't know if there was a rookie of the year category, if you will, in the NASL because so many players were coming over as loans from uh, England or other other uh, places, and and uh, it was kind of hard to sort of, I guess, kind of really kind of cement what a rookie kind of was. I, I know there was a North American player of the year denotation, but uh, if there could have been, if you will, a rookie uh, uh, accolade, I think Steve Hunt would absolutely have uh, qualified, if not won, uh, that kind of award in the North American soccer league. Because this was a kid, literally 20 years old, uh, coming across uh, the ocean after having kind of uh, apprenticed his way into uh, some starting appearances with Aston Villa. And literally, as you'll hear in our conversation coming up in a few minutes, uh, he shows up and after one after a game one day, he's basically uh, met by a guy from this Cosmos team in New York, uh, largely not heard of before, uh, and basically uh, being told by his, uh, his uh, team president and manager that he's been traded to this team that he doesn't even know anything about. Uh, and boy, oh boy, the story kind of gets going from there. But if you remember the 1977 and 78 seasons as, Co- as a Cosmos fan, or frankly, just as an NASL fan seeing uh, a game against the Cosmos, you will know and remember and relish the memories uh, of Steve Hunt. This guy was a, a, a speedy winger. That's a, an understatement. Uh, a big time goal scorer for the Cosmos, uh, literally right out of the box and an assist maker of of great uh, talent for uh, especially the uh, the great and, um, uh, shall we say, opinionated uh, Giorgio Canaglia, uh, one of the greatest goal scorers of all time in North American history, arguably on the on the on the planet. Uh, as you'll hear in our conversation, Steve will have some some very interesting thoughts about Giorgio Canaglia and how he ultimately got along with him. Um, but Steve Hunt, man, oh, man, you, as you heard in that clip, and I think it's really important to sort of set that clip up, that uh, was uh, a highlight from. Soccer Bowl 1977. That was uh, Pele's last uh, match, I guess, uh, for, as uh, part of the Cosmos, a competitive match. August 28th, 1977. The dulcet tones of Jim Carvelis, the voice of the Cosmos, sort of narrating uh, that documentary called A Dream Fulfilled, which is essentially a recap of the 1977 season. And Soccer Bowl played at uh, it, uh, then known as Civic Stadium in Portland, now uh, the home of the current uh, Portland Timbers. I, I forget what the name of the. I know it used to be Genweld. And I, I, I honestly, I'm just. I apologize for not remembering the now new name of the of the uh, of that facility. But it was the Cosmos and the Seattle Sounders sold out crowd over uh, thirty five thousand plus. And the MVP of that game was our guest this week, Steve Hunt. Um, he scored. Actually, he assisted on the winning goal, which came later in the game, uh, in the seventy. I don't know seventy seventy seventh minute. But that goal that you just heard kind of set the uh, the game in motion in the 19th minute or so. A uh, I wouldn't call Steve Hunt a poacher by trade. I think that was more of a Giorgio kind of trade. Uh, but uh, in terms of understanding and taking advantage of the situation in the game, 
Um, you must uh, seek out the clip to actually see what uh, uh, Mr. Carvelis is narrating there. But let's put it this way. It was an exciting, unexpected, heads-up play by a, a very exciting player. And uh, Steve Hunt was, in my mind, Mr. Excitement for sure. Uh, and that's saying something for a star-studded team, and even more stocked, if you will, in 1978 when they repeated as champion. I almost look at that as almost the perfect Cosmos season uh, in their history. Uh, but Steve Hunt, more than an essential cog in that uh, those two very uh, 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 significant years in Cosmos history, and full of stories, and we're going to get into all of them. And it's it's a wonderful uh, chat. It was wonderful to uh, to talk to Steve. I tried not to be too much of a fanboy, but a little hard to do. Um, and of course, uh, we want to recommend to you uh, the book that is coming out. It's available for pre order. Uh, I think it comes out on October 1st in the United States. I think it's available for sale in the UK now, but you can pre-order it on Amazon or go to our website at goodseatstillavailable.com uh, and search up our episode uh, this week, episode 226, and, and pre-order it, why don't you? And pre-order a couple of copies, why don't you? It's called I'm With the Cosmos, The Story of Steve Hunt. And that'll tell you, even though uh, Steve not only had a, a, a bunch of years with Aston Villa uh, and uh, then went back to uh, England and... and uh, had a good six or seven years with Coventry City, uh, loaned back to the Cosmos in 82, and then went on back to the Premier League, or then what is now known as the Premier League, at, at West Brom and, and back to Villa for a spell, uh, at Willenhall Town uh, sort of near the end, uh, a couple of caps for the National Team of England, et cetera, some managerial uh, experiences as well. Um, but it, I think it's saying something by having the Cosmos in the title of your autobiography That'll tell you that those two, three years of a multi-year career uh, were something special. We're going to get into that uh, with Steve Evans. You know him as Steve Hunt coming up in just a few moments time. A delightful conversation, one that I it was just uh, so much fun to have. And uh, I can't wait to get it. Let, let's get to it. So let's uh, get a quick promo out of the way and let's get to it, shall we? Uh, this week, we uh, spin the wheel of fortune to uh, our pal Judd Lasher uh, and it's 417helmets.com, 417-417-helmets.com. Just uh, the numbers and the hel- and the word helmets, 417helmets.com. Promo code, good seats, 10% off all of your purchases. Oh, my goodness. Uh, fantastic site. If, if, um, uh, if you're a football fan uh, and you enjoy uh, teams uh, of uh, the current generation, both at collegiate level even a smaller uh, division collegiate level, uh, the pro level, and especially, interestingly, uh, leagues of the past. Uh, fantastic mini helmets at 417helmets.com. What is a mini helmet, you ask? Well, it's it's like the name implies. It's sort of a, something you can hold in really uh, maybe the palm of your hand, maybe a little bit uh, in two palms of your hands, two hands together, uh, uh, a sort of a miniaturized version, but with the same materials of uh, a, a, an honest to goodness helmet, uh, the same plastic, the same guard wear, the same chin straps, all that stuff, but in miniature form. And it's a, a tremendous memento to commemorate uh, a favorite team, a favorite league. Uh, and look, you can even get stuff made in custom fashion. Uh, uh, Judd is um, uh, even uh, now uh, just uh, struck a licensing deal with the uh, Negro League Baseball Museum and will have a collection of um, uh, commemorative helmets uh, bearing the names and the logos of some of the uh, the better known teams uh, from the old Negro Leagues. And and that's the kind of stuff you can do on a custom level uh, at 417helmets.com. You want to have your company logo uh, emblazoned uh, with quality on a mini helmet or perhaps uh, create them as a tchotchke or as a giveaway for a uh, a corporate party. You're coming back to the office for the first time in two years. You can do that. Uh, perhaps there's a, you're a radio station or uh, uh, some other, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's a community uh, organization and stuff. You want to slap your logo on there and uh, have that as a unique uh, giveaway or piece uh, to perhaps raise some money or whatever. Uh, it makes a the proverbial great gift at 417helmets. Dot com. Check them out. You'll see what I mean when you scroll, scroll to the site. You want a football team uh, of your uh, that's already in the in the um, in the catalog there? Fine. If you don't see one you want, uh, Judd will uh, work one up for you. And like I said, it doesn't have to be about a football thing. It could be any kind of logo or or message or whatever you want. Judd is 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 uh, fantastic at helping you co-create 
uh, a custom made mini helmet. And again, it's all there for you to choose from, select, uh, buy early and often from it. 417helmets.com. Again, don't forget to write down and use early and often that promo code good seats for 10% off all of your purchases. Thank you, Judd. And thank you, great listeners, for not only checking them out, we appreciate that, uh, but also listening intently and uh, hopefully enjoyably. Uh, here's our conversation we have with the great Steve Hunt. Yes, he's now known as Steve Evans, but uh, you remember him as Steve Hunt. It's a, a fantastic conversation. You Cosmos fans, sit back and please enjoy. For me, uh, as a kid, um, uh, there was probably nothing more, um, I don't know, central and or uh, overwhelmingly uh, intriguing to me than the uh, the story of the New York Cosmos, because it, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, neatly conjoined with my sort of um, supposed march towards adulthood. And uh, there was probably nobody more exciting uh, to watch uh, for the three years or three seasons that you were part of the Cosmos than than you as Steve Hunt. And uh, it's an honor and uh, pleasure to uh, finally meet you or, or talk to you. And uh, the book is wonderful and brings back a treasure trove of memories. And I suspect that when the U.S. Uh, gets its hot little hands on the uh, on, on the book when it comes out later this fall, uh, a lot of New York Cosmos fans, both um, who were there and and wish they were there, will, uh, will eat it up. So congrats. Thank you very much, Tim. Well, let us uh, let us begin then. Uh, do you, do you want to start with the uh, the, the name change uh, situation? I mean, we use that as a table set. <laughs> um, no big deal, really. Um, I remarried in '95. Um, my father left uh, home when I was 16, and I always said um, I didn't want to carry his name on. So when when I retired from football, I took my mother's uh, Christian name. So th that's the way. Uh, it came about and I've, I've stuck with it ever since. But obviously, in football terms, I'm still Steve Hunt. Well, it, it's certainly understandable for sure. And um, despite being a, 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 a very famous uh, and successful football player, um, you're a human being, right? And you've got, we all have issues and, and situations and, and yeah. things that we need to do and feel comfortable and, and important and uh, solid about. And um, uh, you are no exception to that. So, you know, no... Uh, uh, no uh, background necessarily needed. All right, so let us uh, just kind of just jump uh, sort of into it. So I, the very fact, right, that you uh, title uh, the upcoming book, at least in the United States, uh, available for pre-order, as we will certainly promote for sure, um, is indicative. Uh, the fact that you title your book, I'm with the Cosmos, um, yeah. to me is uh, telling, right? Uh, because... I think let's let's you know for the side of the American fan, right? Um, you had a very fledgling career uh, in England and went back to one as well, um, but yet here these three seasons, if you will, or more uh, with the Cosmos, kind of really stuck out. Um, the title, why that? Uh, was it that searing and that? Um, I, I suspect it was. Uh, a, a pinnacle or or certainly a, a really memorable part of a very long and, and successful career? Well, my co-author, uh, Ian McCauley, came up with On With The Cosmos. Uh, we, we had two or three uh, titles, but that was the one that really hit home for me. Um, so thanks, Ian, for that. Um, obviously, that phrase was used many times uh, with The Cosmos. Uh, it got us in many nightclubs, shall I say. <laughs> and... Um, and uh, it was just used quite often. Um, and I've always felt that I'm with the cosmos. Oh, you know, it's in my heart. Uh, I've got such fond memories of the cosmos and America in itself. And I do return as often as I can because I just love being over there. Well, but but let, let's even go back a step further, right? So in the mid-70s, your... Uh, uh, establishing yourself as a uh, as a standout player with Aston Villa, um, uh, maybe you can kind of sort of describe your uh, I would call it apprenticeship. I guess uh, you certainly recount a few uh, sort of classic apprenticeship type stories. Um, yeah. But 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 how much did you even know of this Cosmos thing? Because come 1977 or so, or 1976 or so, when you sort of I I, I, I 
I struggle to believe, aside from the signing of Pele, which was itself a worldwide event, very few people in the football community knew what this Cosmos thing even was. Yeah, um, I must admit it came out of the blue, uh, the chance to play for the Cosmos. Um, I'd done an apprenticeship at, at, at Aston Villa. It was a successful youth team I played in, uh, progressed to the first team, played seven games. Um, and the manager called me in one morning, quite out of the blue, and said he'd sold me. The, <laughs> uh, so it, was, it really was a shock. Um, and the, the guy in the canteen waiting to talk to me was a, a guy named Joe Malley, uh, bless him, who's a, who's a lovely guy. He was the assistant manager with the Cosmos at the time to Gordon Bradley. Um, and it all happened within minutes. You know, he, he explained that... Uh, They'd been watching me and they'd like me to go and play over there. And I have to admit, I, I had very little knowledge of the, the game in the States at that time. Uh, you know, I was only 20 years old. Um, but Joe's words were, well, you, you'll have some interesting teammates. Um, one of them will be Pele. And there was this silence from me as if to say, Really? You know, the chance to play with the greatest footballer ever, you know, you just don't turn that down. So it was a massive adventure uh, for a 20 year old, um, one that I don't regret at all. Did, did you and your teammates kind of e truly even have any sort of uh, understanding or consciousness of what the certainly then fledgling pro game was in the United States? It certainly had had its ups and downs and certainly there was. Uh, had been a fairly steady trickle, I guess, of especially yeah. English players right prior to that. But yeah. uh, how much did you, you and your your colleagues and your teammates and 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 sort of the football world in, in England kind of really know uh, about a North American kind of uh, version of the sport? Or was it still pretty much uh, an unknown en entity? It was unknown. Um, a guy named Paul Childs, I don't know if you remember him, uh, Absolutely, a, a, a former member, yeah. a former interviewee of uh, of our little podcast. Yes, well, there you go. Well, Paul, a little bit older than me, but he was one of the first to to make his way across the Atlantic and forge himself a very good career. Obviously, um, and as you said, there was a steady trickle, but didn't really hit home until that conversation with Joe Mallet. What was going on over in the states, and it it, it was just exciting to to think I would be able to be part of it. What what did you think you were getting into then? Once you heard that, and once the I guess the reality sunk in. I number one, I guess, is probably a feeling of, hey, I I, I probably I I envisioned a career with Villa, and this is not happening. That's probably a disappointment sort of element to that. But but what did you at that moment before you even got on the airplane with your wife? What did you what did you think you were getting into, or or were you just completely a blank slate, and you just were going to go with the flow and just quote unquote see what happened? Obviously, I was very nervous. Um, we, we met up. I was supposed to meet the rest of the, the team um, in Bermuda, of all places. That, you know, um, I've been used to playing, you know, in the UK and the, our usual temperatures, so we say. And there I was on a plane and I was on my own, but my wife didn't come with me for that. But she uh, met me in New York afterwards. But um, so I was very, very nervous arriving in Bermuda. Um, but I needn't have worried because not only Pelly himself, who was was superb, um, but all the staff, uh, all the American guys behind the scenes and everything made me feel really, really comfortable. And I, I never looked back after that. I, would, I had a few ups and downs, you know, homesickness and all that. But uh, I was made to feel very welcome. So that essentially was in the middle or sort of near the... Begin. Um, I'm just. So that was probably in February, March, or so. So that was yep. probably in the height of the English Premier. Well, that wasn't Premier League then, but the 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 Division One. Uh, sorry, the whatever the top tier was called at that time. Yeah, and Division season, One. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and, right. And season. Right. And you're essentially coming into this Cosmos thing as they're doing their uh, what soon became very famous uh, 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 preseason sort of tour uh, scenarios. Yeah. That's right. I mean. After Bermuda, we went back to, to New York, um, did a few training sessions, got to know everyone. And then the first two games were away and they were at um, Las Vegas and Hawaii. So <laughs> for a 20-year-old 20 uh, 20 uh, English guy that 
didn't have a clue what was going to be ahead of him. It was so exciting. It really was. So, well, uh, and it was also it was also interesting too. And I'm sure you understood at least some of the 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 beginnings of the story that preceded you, right? You had a Pelé, right? Uh, world famous, highest paid player, arguably, and in my mind, absolutely the best to ever play the game uh, in his third and final season, right? So, and the pressure, I think, from what he and what he walked into in 1975 to what he was essentially trying to leave with in at the end of 1977. But you were also walking into, and again, maybe unbeknownst to you, uh, but, but but maybe you sort of understood some of the backstories you learned. Uh, there was this, it was, the, the, this franchise was absolutely on the move towards bigger things than it had been uh, by moving into this cavernous giant stadium, which was what, 78,000 seats, right? Um, with artificial right. turf to boot. Um, did you get a sense uh, I mean, aside from being like, wow, starstruck, if you will, or being part of the New York thing, just generally, did you get a sense you were sort of in the midst of a story kind of building here uh, as a uh, it, team? Yeah, yeah. It, uh, eventually, uh, it, early doors, you know, I, I thought we struggled as a team. Uh, we was a bit indifferent. But as it gradually built throughout the season, the, the momentum, and obviously the arrival of uh, Franz Beckenbauer, and Carlos Alberto took us on to another level. And and that's when it got really exciting. And we, we thought, we've got a chance of this now. And for Pelé himself, obviously, that was the aim. Can we get to the final and win it? How quickly were you um, brought into uh, uh, the play, uh, starting and that kind of stuff? Because you're, you can't, I mean, I, 77, you, not only were you brand new to the team, uh, and obviously a bunch of players uh, would be layered in as, during the course of the season, as you mentioned. We'll get to that. But um, it, it seems to me that you were quickly understood as being a um, a player that could make an impact uh, quickly and, and start regularly and just and go versus sort of sitting on a bench or or warming up or being a, a repl- you know a, a a substitute kind of player, right? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, the, the Cosmos bought me for a, for a reason. And I must admit, I, I thought, I did question myself to begin with. I thought, you know, am I going to be good enough to play alongside these great players? Um, and I, I just remember thinking, look, you've made the move. Uh, you've been brave enough to come over here. You, you're playing with some of the greatest players in the world. Um, you've got to go for it. You've got to give everything you've got. Um, which I did, um, and I think the the, the uh, Cosmos fans appreciated uh, not only the you know the stats of myself, but obviously the 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 willingness to to run around a lot because <laughs> um, I was young and I, about I bought fresh legs to some of the older players. Well, there was no question that uh, the team was very much uh, expected to be entertaining in its style right and and we'll we'll get into sort of how the coaching changes sort of exacerbated that over time right but there's no question I mean you you brought not only speed but verve and uh excitement and enthusiasm I mean I I think it's pretty clear any any fan that was uh watching you from the stands that uh you were just a, a a bundle of energy and productive energy at that which was was uh appreciated by the fans who yeah, you, know, you weren't the quintessential, I guess. I hate to say this, English player uh, that had kind of dominated the 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 the, uh, the imports uh, to date th- at that point. Yeah, I, I think there was there was a doubt in, in some of the hierarchy, should we say, that I was just another Englishman coming across to make some money and go home. Well, that was never the the intention of myself. It, it was, you know, to prove that I could make it in the states. Um, and play alongside these great players. So, you know, I think I um, opened a few eyes, uh, shall we say, in Warner Brothers. And as the season went on, you know, I think they realised that they, they, they got a bargain. Well, um, I, that, that's an understatement, I believe. Um, <laughs> what, uh, tell me what your first kind of... Uh, so, I, obviously, you're starting on the road in, in probably the two most 
semi exotic places and really a, a real good uh, a testimony about what this North American <laughs> soccer league was in Las Vegas and Hawaii. But, but yeah. tell me what, if you can remember what your first game or two at home was like, and, and maybe has, as the season progressed, how people, I think kind of latched on to your name as a, and, and play as a fan favorite. Cause I, I, as I remember it, right. You, you were absolutely somebody who you'd listen for intently in the starting lineups. Yeah. I, th- I think the biggest challenge for me early doors was uh, playing on Astro Astro turf. Uh, I've never played on in my life before. What, was that so, the first time uh, with giant stadium or, or, or the league itself? Yeah. First time ever. Um, they, they got a couple of, uh, Places in the in in England uh, down the lower divisions that have got uh, artificial turf, should we say? But it was it was nothing like what we had at Giant Stadium, so it, it was all new to me. And I remember making a typical English sliding tackle and ripping my my legs to pieces, and, and thinking I won't be doing that again. So uh, it took a while to get used to, but I think in the end it, it kind of suited my game, you know. Um, and I'm glad you said productive energy um, because, you know, assist goals, you know, you, that, that's that got to go along with all the energy that you put into it. So it, it took a while. Um, and then one week you might be playing on grass. So, again, you've got, you've got to adjust again. Adjust again. Um, but I must say, like, not just the superstars of the, the, the Cosmos, but the American boys and the other nationalities were, were terrific, you know. And it, it, was, it was like a family. So... There was never any pressure, um, lots of encouragement, and we, we were never wanting for anything. You know, we had everything at our disposal to make us the team we was. All right, I'm going to get back to that family thing in a second, but before we leave the turf situation, I, I'm I'm really curious to hear your initial thoughts and then your ongoing thoughts about uh, the various stadia that you played in in the North American Soccer League and yeah. the travel. And the schedule, right? I I think it's lost on a lot of people. You look back on on some of the scheduling of the old NASL. I mean, it, you know, there's arguments today about oh, the players overworked and stuff by playing twice a week today, right? And relatively, but yeah. not only were we doing that in the NASL, I, I would argue there would be like two day windows and, and and ridiculous travel. I'm sure you were completely flummoxed by this massive. Uh, expanse of of, uh, of geography that you had to cover as being part of yep. the team, albeit in private jets or or at least in the Cosmos higher class way, it still was travel that you probably weren't used to at all. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, obviously all I've been used to is tra- traveling on a coach, uh, playing a game and coming back the same day. Um, with the Cosmos, <laughs> you'd be days, you know, sometimes weeks away from home and, you know, just focus on the football um, but, you know, it was a great way to, to see the States as well. You know, it was a real eye opener for me. Um, and I keep saying, it, you know, I was, I was only 20 years old. Um, but after a few initial um, setbacks, early doors, you know, a couple of um, disagreements with certain people, uh, I felt I settled down, started to grow up a little bit. And it just went from strength to strength then. Uh, let's, all right. So let's get into the family. Um, I, I, I guess. The easiest entry into that is the fact that as you travel around this country and play uh, as the Cosmos, right, the Warner Communications thing, the Steve Ross thing, the, all the big stars and stuff, um, how quickly did you realize that this club was sort of in a different orbit, no, no pun intended, than the, the average North American Soccer League team? Because I, there's... You guys were doing everything first class and the money was behind it. But I would argue the other, well, in 77, other 17 teams and another 23 teams when it expanded the, the year later were not near that kind of level of, um, I wouldn't call it pampering, but uh, treatment, I guess. Uh, you were seen with with a red carpet just about everywhere you were going. Absolutely. I mean, we were very fortunate, you know. Um, I always felt fortunate to have that kind of backing. Um, but you're there to be shot at. And, you know, when you are the Cosmos at, at that time, as you, you are there to be brought down a peg or two. And we we got um, some harsh treatment at times, away from home especially. Um, teams couldn't compete 
So, you know, they, they roughed it up a little bit, which, you know, they're, they're perfectly entitled to. Um, but, yeah, you did feel special. I, I certainly felt special um, and very humble playing for the Cosmos at that time. Um, to have that kind of backing uh, was terrific. And it, uh, obviously, it got, it's got to help you on the field, hasn't it? Well, look, and I think uh, there are a lot of players, uh, and perhaps yourself included, that uh, relish that opportunity because you know how good you are and or special you are uh, and unique uh, in people's minds as being either the villain or the, the the glamour team and stuff. And and if everybody's gunning for you, right, that in many respects should hopefully help elevate your game and make it more of a, of a, an enterprise for you to versus just, you know, playing it out. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, when we did eventually win the the uh, soccer bowl that year, I remember when I returned in '78, and it was a totally different ball game for me because I'd made a name for myself. I'd, I'd gone over there unknown, and obviously, especially towards the end of the season, um, I'd a, had a good finish to it. When I came back in '78, you know, I was double marked, I was man marked, I was kicked, and I, and it, for a while it took me a while to acclimatise to that. You know, that, that was another step up for me. I had to figure ways to, you know, to um, to beat people again. You know, what what I'd done the first season wasn't enough. I had to come up with other ways. And I remember talking to Dennis Church about it because obviously Dennis was. Um, you know, well-established well back in England and, you know, a fantastic player and a great guy. And he spoke to me at length about it and, uh, you know, and he gave me a few pointers that really helped that second season. Um, and I came through a phase of, of um, I'm not saying not playing so well, but not as good a level as I'd like to. And he was a big help with that. Yeah, uh, you're actually scratching on something that, that I think is a really interesting dynamic. I'd love to get your opinion on Um as a in my fans eye okay um 1977 for the cosmos and 1978 uh were very uh, different seasons uh both successful at the end of course yeah. um but 77 was sort of like the last if you will sort of uh, pieces of assemblage of uh the powerhouse uh players and uh and fabric if you will and 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 in 78, right, uh, things were happening as well beyond that, right? Not only were the Cosmos crowned as champions, but um, you now had 24 teams in this league, right? Which yep. not all of them necessarily uh, of the most stable variety. Um, you had uh, made a name for yourself with your your uh, rugged and, and successful play in 77. So there was a lot more smarts, if you will, in terms of coaching and tactics against how to how to control and, and better play against you. Um, what, besides your own personal journey, did you notice any sort of difference between seventy seven and seventy eight? Seventy seven was very ascendant. Nineteen seventy eight was almost like a, I don't know, a coronation, if you will, or or yeah. a, a, a doubling down, a stamp of approval of what had been created. Yeah, I mean that first season will always be a standout for obvious reasons uh, with Pele retiring and seeing him held aloft at the end of that game um, you know it, it was just unbelievable and you'll, you'll never replace that I mean it, it's a it's a one-off and uh, I think about it on a regular basis but as you say this the, when we came back in 78 that the the game had um, changed there was a lot of there was good teams in 77 but not so many and in 78, there was a lot of really good good teams and good players and a lot more people joining, uh, shall we say, the, you know, the, the influx of players coming from Europe and South America and that. So it was tough. Um, I, I've said in the book, um, 78, our team for me was better than the 77 team and that had Pelé in it. If we'd have had Pelly in '78, <laughs> that would have been some team. No, I think I think that's actually correct. I, I a very much a good assessment. Um, uh, that '78, '78 almost in many respects felt more like a, if you will, a perfect season, right? I mean, I mean the the record was. I mean, you only lost a handful of games. Uh, the drama that was there with the the shootout in Minnesota and then coming back yeah. and, and winning all of that, um, and then the crowning uh, uh, achievement, right? Winning the soccer bowl at home at the Meadowlands. I mean, you could, yeah. I don't think you could have scripted it any better. And I think you're absolutely right. 77 sort of had the uncertainty 
component to it and the, uh, I guess the dramatic sort of script, if you will, right? Like will Pele win his final championship and, and the way we'll talk about your soccer bowl in 77 in a minute, but, yeah. but 78 almost seemed like everything sort of went according to plan. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and maybe for the better bent of the league, or maybe the beginning of, of what maybe the league should not have become, uh, as a result. Yeah. I mean, any, any sportsman will tell you that the hardest thing to do, um, is not to win the league, it's to regain it the following season, you know, to, to win the championship again. But we had the incentive that we knew the final was going to be a giant stadium. We also, um, obviously, we'd had a change of management from Gordon Bradley to Eddie Fermani in that halfway through the, the 77 season, which was a remarkable change. Um, but I think the biggest turnabout in that, that yeah, you, you've... you've uh, scratch the service a little bit was uh, Minnesota away when we got hammered and I've never been so embarrassed in my life about um, a performance not only myself but for the team and we got a right dressing down from uh, Steve Ross and, and various people in the organisation and I, I honestly believe we needed it we, we needed to be beaten like that because I'm not saying we were overconfident but we were just like beating teams for fun and we needed to kick up the backside, and that's what we got that game. Yeah, and and Steve is referencing uh, a, a a dramatic and and I think just searing um, a series. And, and you have to remember the North American Soccer League at the time, uh, the playoff system was sort of this two and a half game, I guess, playoff series where you had a, it was a, a home and home series. And the first game was a midweek game in Minnesota. This is in uh, the uh, late summer of 78. And you were pasted, right? Nine to two uh, yeah. by Minnesota. And um, talk about ratcheting up the drama, right? I, I, in many <laughs> respects, much of 1978 was a coronation, I guess, or just a validation. Yeah. Um, and nine to two, I, I, don't th I think that still stands out as probably one of, if not the, greatest uh, defeats in the team's 11 plus year history. Um, yeah. I mean, it, the, 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 they deserved it as well. They were absolutely superb on the night and I'll take nothing away from them, but I felt we were too overconfident on the night and we got what we deserved. So as I say, it was that kick up the, the rear that we needed. Um, and we never looked back from that. Well, all right. So uh, let's use that, and then I want to go back into the, the 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 fabric and how this team sort of came together in the first place. But but why don't we stay with that moment? Because what do you remember about the the follow up game, which was uh, a, a mere three days later, back in at Giant Stadium in New York? Um, you mentioned Steve Ross giving you a lambasting. What else was going on? I mean, the, the obviously the press was now paying attention to this team. Certainly it had in 77 and, and was even more so in 78. Um, what was going through the locker room? What was, what was the, the, the lead up? What was the practices? What, were they, what, what was going on in, in your heads? Like you said you needed the kick in the rear, but I mean, how tension filled was it? And, and did were you know, were players really stepping up and taking it seriously? I mean, I, I'm just really curious as to what the dynamic was like as you guys took the field and then frankly, how did it play out on the field? Because you, you, I mean, it was probably one of the most exciting sports moments that I have ever been part of. Yeah. I mean, after uh, Steve Ross had give us that dressing down uh, as players, especially uh, Giorgio um, and obviously the, the other um, uh, superstar players of the team at that time, uh, they sat us down and we, we talked about it you know, both individually and as a collective team and said, look, we just had our nose bloodied. How do we respond? Do we crawl away under a stone? Um, or do we show what the cosmos is really about? And as I said, I think it was a massive turning point. Um, everybody was, you know, I get back to that family feeling again. Everybody pulled in the right direction, both on and off the field. You know, the coaching staff, the trainers, locker room boys, everybody was up for that game and um, the, the first thing because it wasn't on, on an aggregate basis you know all we needed to do was win the game we didn't have to make up seven goals so I think we won it 4-0 if I remember um, and won it well so then it went into uh, extra time 
and then obviously ended up with uh, a shootout. Uh, the emotions in that game were going up and down. You know, it was absolutely incredible. And obviously the standout for me was Carlos Alberto's shootout kick, which was, well, let's just say very memorable. Yeah, you describe it in the book, and and I think people also forget too that Franz uh, Beckenbauer had a fairly yeah. sleek and silky uh, 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 shot as well, very somewhat similar in terms of lifting it in the air and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, talk, I mean, uh, the, the the film is out there, and and obviously, if if you're a Cosmos fan, you you know it well. If you have not experienced this, uh, just the madness of the uh, the mechanisms of uh, sudden death overtime, which I think, frankly. Uh, it could it could certainly inject a little bit more life into certain soccer games today, uh, and yeah. the shootout, right? Um, uh, I, I'm I'm um, I'm curious as to what you thought about the shootout specifically, not necessarily that game, but as a mechanism to break ties and just the manner in which uh, versus say penalty kicks. A fan, not a fan. Yeah. Uh, obviously, a novelty for you at the time. It was a novelty, and uh, I didn't have a particularly good record in taking them. Um, and I remember uh, asking Franz Beckenbauer, you know, uh, can you help me? Because I'm not, you know, my goal scoring ratio in the shootouts wasn't good. So he said, have you ever tried shooting with the outside of your foot? Which, of course, he was a master of. And I thought, I'll try it. So I think it was Fort Lauderdale away in 77. Um, and I scored. And I, <laughs> and I didn't look back after that. I, I, I didn't always use the outside of my foot, but it was a, a massive help. But I think on the on the shootout side of things, I think you have to give great credit not only to the the penalty takers but the the goalkeepers. I mean, Shep Messian, Jack Brand um, kept us in shootouts over those two seasons. They really did. They were absolutely fantastic in shootout in situations. What do you think about the idea of sudden death overtime? Uh, not necessarily just for playoffs, but but the idea of that for in the game itself to literally come up with a winner. Um, certainly another novelty for you coming from the English game. Great if you win it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, but, I mean, um, I mean, but I mean, in terms of excitement and, and getting in, uh, involved yeah. and, and wanting to win it, and from, from the fans' perspective, I mean, talk about an Americanized innovation, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. for better or for worse, as a fan, as an American new to the sport, I, yeah. I can't imagine why you wouldn't have a sudden death over time, but that, that wasn't the, that wasn't the world's game in the way, uh, you know, no. the way you were playing in England. Well, it was fun, wasn't it? Let's be honest. I mean, what, what, what the, the States did, it, it, it brought the game out even further for the spectators. It made it fun, you know, and people are on the edge of the seats, what's going to happen next. I, I remember that Minnesota, the, the sudden death, uh, I think it was Alan Wiley. Yeah. He'd scored. Yeah. Alan Will, yeah. 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 Yeah, he'd scored uh, three or four goals in the first game. And in that sudden death, put a terrific header into the top corner and somehow Jack Brand managed to save it. So we would have been out, you know. And so that excitement for the fans, you know, and then we went on to win it, you know. So it's such an up and down roller coaster of emotions. But uh, for the excitement, yeah, I'm a big fan of it, definitely. What's this? Box of Awesome. Oh, man. Hey, this summer, Bespoke Post is here to take your adventures to the next level with their new lineup of must-have Box of Awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every month. Uh, I have been uh, lucky enough to receive one of these uh, boxes, and the one I chose is called the Weekender, uh, and it's a gorgeous uh, overnight bag. Uh, in uh, beautiful colors. Uh, mine is in olive with uh, brown trim, uh, but the, it comes in all kinds of different colors. And it's just perfect for those weekend getaways. Uh, you don't need uh, sort of that valise or that uh, overnight garment bag or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's it's fantastic. And it comes from a, a company that I never would have heard of uh, called Line of Trade. And they've really done a gorgeous job with this thing. And I've been using it uh, literally the last couple of weeks for all my little travel uh, needs and and so no matter what you're into box of awesome has you covered from travel and outdoor gear to breezy summer styles and grooming goods box of awesome has collections for just about every part of your life now uh i notice a whole bunch of other ones if you're sort of into bourbon 
sampling, if you're an outdoorsman, uh, if you enjoy sort of uh, uh, on the go uh, beverages, especially uh, when you're out there in the hot sun, uh, perhaps you, uh, you're a big taco fan. Uh, and you want to sort of reinvigorate your uh, your process of uh, of creating and uh, and uh, enjoying uh, taco night at your own home. All those and many many more so fantastic and very creative things. It's clothing. Some of them are food related. Some of them have to do with uh, personal grooming. They're just awesome, literally uh, and figuratively, collections of stuff. Uh, and uh, they're yours uh, to peruse and subscribe to. And it's a, it's a tremendous concept. And uh, again, box of awesome. It's uh, it's something that you can take advantage of. To get started, you take the quiz at boxofawesome.com and your answers will help them pick the right box of awesome for you. They release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories, as I just hinted at to you, and it's free to sign up. Plus, you can also skip a month or cancel at any time. Each box costs only 45 bucks, but it's got over at least guaranteed to be over $70 worth of gear inside. It's a really cool concept. Check them out. And of course, we've got an incentive for you to do so. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code GOODSEATS at checkout. Yes, that's boxofawesome.com. Promo code GOODSEATS for 20% off your first box box thank you box of awesome and uh please uh, let's enjoy the rest of our conversation well let me ask you a few other of the rule changes that you had to adjust to too um did you have any opinion or thoughts uh positively or negatively about uh the points system right which was what six points for a win but it also incentivized uh scoring goals at least up to three, yeah. even if you were losing, you would still get some uh, some points in the standings for continuing to play, even though you might be down, say, 2-0. Yeah, well, I think tactical-wise, it, it makes you an, want to attack. And obviously the Cosmos were all about that. You know, was, I don't think we ever, ever went out to, to you know, tie a game or just to counter-attack, as the, you see a lot in the, the modern game. It was always... How many goals can we score and hope that we can score more than the opposition? And I think with that point system, it helped because if you're a goal scoring team, you got those extra points. So I was a big fan of it. Well, yeah. And you're also a speedy winger, right? Uh, buzzing around the goal and, and and setting people up in the in the center, right? A lot, right? I got to think that that's just, that's, that's jet fuel for you. Yeah. And I think the other thing that helped was the uh, 35 yard line. That's my next question. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think that was great. I think that should be uh, throughout the world now. I've always said that. Um, they trialled it in England, but unfortunately they threw it back out. But I just think it opens the game up. It gives the, the ball players a lot more space to play. Uh, it, you don't get so many constant um, stoppages for offsides. And, and the game just flowed better. And the, there was a lot more skill involved. I, I, I think that it was a great, great rule. All right. Well, that's spoken, of course, like a great uh, forward slash goal scorer, right? But, but how, about, how about your defensive <laughs> friends? How do they feel about it? Or, and goalkeepers, too? Well, you know, I mean, 35 yards from the, from the, from the goal line, it, it's still pushing you back four up or back three as it is now sometimes. So it's not that much difference. It, you know, it's... It, it's small margins, but it's just enough to to be able to see good ball players on the ball and, and have a passing team and players running at defenders. As you say, for defenders, they'd probably prefer the other way. But uh, certainly our guys adjusted really well to it. and We, we had a terrific defence. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and you look, I, I, I love the sport. Uh, I don't love the sort of the dour of zero, zero uh, draws and the cynical play and the you know parking of the bus and all that kind of stuff. I understand the tactics completely. Um, but, you know, a, a, as a fan um, and, and sadly, I see a lot more of that sort of sluggish and cynical play the, uh, uh, seemingly at the top, the, 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 at the top tiers of the tournaments and whatnot, right? It's more about playing yeah. not to lose versus playing to kind of go for it and win, right? Yeah, well, we've seen that at the European Championships just recently. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of possession football, but you like to see an end product. You like to see uh, shots on goal, crosses into the box, people running at people. Yeah, excitement, like we were just talking about. You want to see excitement. And I, I don't see excitement from seeing 
30 passes when you're just going sideways and backwards. You know, there's got to be an end product. So you've got to, you know, as players, you should be there to entertain the crowd and people watching. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just wish we'd be more adventurous, shall we say. Well, you seem more uh, accommodating to all those rule changes. Uh, did your did your star-studded uh, assemblage of teammates agree? And frankly, other league players, did they, did they all sort of gravitate to these rules too or not? I believe so. I believe so. Um, I can only um, talk about the ones I, I, I was part of and with and, and opposition players had spoken to. But yeah, I, I think everybody was in agreement with it. You know, I, I, you know, I thought it was terrific two or three, maybe four years of the NASL. You know, it's exciting. You know, it, it, it put the states on the map. It got more importantly, the younger children, both uh, boys and girls, getting interested into the game. And when you look at the states now and uh, the, the amount of players they've produced and, you know, certainly the, the, the ladies team, absolutely brilliant. I love to watch it. I really do. So I'd like to think we had something to do with that in those early days. How about the... Um... The rule, the the other sort of major change, right, which was the and for various reasons, right, the uh, the stipulation that there had to be at least three North American born or naturalized players on the field at all times for each team. Yeah, well, I think it was the right thing because it, let's be honest, it, it was uh, America's league, so you've got to you know you've got to associate with your American players. And we were fortunate because we had terrific American players and it can uh, change a game, you know. So some of, shall we say, the lesser teams, and there wasn't that many, um, didn't have the quality of the American players and, and they, you know, they needed more. And that's what I'm saying. Over the years, there's more and more American players on a, on a certain level that could compete. And I thought I thought it was great. I, I, you know, I, I, when did they actually stop that rule? Oh, I think that rule was pretty much in play. I think pretty much through the yeah. through the rest of its existence, right? Um, and I think they may have tinkered with it to even add more a little. Uh, I think maybe in the latter year of yeah. its existence. But yeah, I mean, yeah, this is sort of the uh, how do you Americanize the game? I mean, certainly the yeah. rules make a difference, right? But God forbid the American player could actually and and look, you played with some of the some of the more standout players of, of, um, of that era. I mean, like a guy like Rick Davis, right. I mean, who's yeah. been on this yes. show. I mean, here's a guy uh, you're rooming with Gary Etherington, who was yes. very, very good too. Uh, Steve yeah. Moyers was part of that. I mean, there's a lot of them. I, it's interesting in your book, uh, you talk about um, uh, one of your roommates, I think maybe uh, for a, a decent period of time was Gary Etherington, right? Um, yes. Yes. That's right. In, in some respects, it almost feels again, the way I read some of your book here is that, you almost kind of, uh, kind of uh, aligned almost uh, uh, more uh, quickly with some of the American players. I did. Uh, I think it, as well. It was because the majority were more my age group. <laughs> you know, the the, the um, certain Frank, Pelly, Giorgio. These kind of guys were, you know, um, getting on for the thirties, whereas I was just coming out the twenties. So the, the American guys, you know. I kind of gravitated to, um, and you know, uh, Gary became a, a very close friend, and we we still keep in touch to this day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we we had some terrific uh, American players when when you think back. Well, let's talk about some of those players. Let's let's go back to '77, and we'll kind of go through the the, the three seasons and stuff, right? So, yes. let's talk about some of these some of these names, right? Uh, let's start at the, you know, at the white hot center. Right. Uh, and, and you were part of the documentary 10 years ago, a lot of the speculation and, you know, he's, he's no longer with us to d defend himself, so to speak, but there's no question. And I'm not the guy who wrote this, uh, this phrase, but Giorgio Canaglia was the straw that stirred the drink, right. For, for better, or for worse <laughs> and everything in between. Um, why don't we start there? Well, he, uh, had just joined the club in 76, just prior to you sh uh, joining. And yeah. aside from Pelé, he was, I would think, I'm trying to think very carefully, he was pretty much the, the closest thing to a another star that the Cosmos had, but obviously very much, uh, you know, uh, behind that of the high wattage Pelé, for sure, at least in international terms, I think. 
Yeah, well, it's, let's put in, things into perspective. Giorgio, by far, was the best goal scorer I ever played with. Undeniable. Absolutely. And uh, I, I talk about, about Giorgio a lot back here in, in, in England. Uh, you know, his name crops up a lot for various reasons. And I said, the one thing you'll never take away is, is goal scoring. He, he was just unbelievable. So it was a, an honour to play alongside him. We, we had our moments, and I've, I've described it in the book. Um, you know, um, we had a, a bit of um, a fight, should we say, in training. Um, and what he said to I me was going to say row, Steve, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll call it a row then. <laughs> um, but what he said to me, and it's always stuck with me, he said, look, you're here to make goals for me. That's exactly what he said. He can say any more. He said, you're here to make goals for me. You make goals for me, we'll get on fine. And that, that's the day I, I started to understand what Giorgio was about. And, and after that, we got along tremendously well, especially on the field. Um, as I say, I did uh, contribute to a lot of his goals. So hopefully he appreciated that. Okay, so something, a bunch of things to unpack there. Well, that, that certainly speaks to... Um, and you're a, you're a forward winger, a goal scorer, right? And, and you probably can appreciate this or understand it, right? And I'm, I'm not one, but I, the, what I've read over the years, right, is that, um, you know, goalkeepers are a special breed, but so are, so are goal scorers, right? And um, you have to have some of that. Uh, and maybe arguably Giorgio had a hefty, hefty uh, amount of it, right, of confidence, uh, bordering on arrogance or or other you know things that fuel you to do better, constantly score, be the center of attention and attraction. I mean, there's nothing more uh, uh, you know uh, it, 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 emphatic uh, than a than a goal scored in a game where you may only get a couple, right? So, yeah. I, but but I think it's fair to say though, right? And I'll put words in your mouth. Um, it, that that um, egocentric uh, approach, right, which is I think a fierce and, and important component of being a successful goal scorer on the field, um, could easily and did easily bleed over into other aspects of the game and or the club and the dynamics and the the cohesion of the team. No, oh, without doubt, yeah. But everybody knew what Georgia was about. Um, if he hadn't gone, if he'd gone two games without scoring a goal, watch out because he would be in a foul mood. <laughs> so, we, you know, everybody knew what they had to do. Let's get him a goal and then he'll uh, put a smile back on his face. Yeah, there's a lot been said about George, but, uh, you know, I, you've got to have that selfishness. You've got to have that one way ticket that he always bought, which was the goal, you know, um, whether it be Pele, Beckenbauer, anybody. He wouldn't pass if he had a chance at goal. No way. And I accepted it the more it went on because his uh, return on goals was just second to none. So I, it was a privilege to play with him. No, I get it. I, I, but but you have certainly scored a, a, a hell of a lot of goals and especially crucial ones al along the way. And I would argue your your personality didn't necessarily bleed over. Look, don't don't get me wrong. You're talking to somebody who actually at the time had a Giorgio Canalia fan club card in yeah. his pocket in his uh, wallet at the time. So um, there you go. <laughs> well, so so all right. So, but t uh, tell me about then uh, Pele, of course, right? So um, obviously uh, a special player uh, across the the uh, the ages. Um, what was your interactions with him? Your your introduction to him. And his style of play with you in '77, because you got along pretty famously. We did eventually. Um, we had one spat on the field, um, which happens in games. Um, that was quickly resolved by me being substituted. <laughs> so, well, explain like, that. Is that age and youth kind of uh, colliding, or 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 what? Uh, it was a misunderstanding. Um, as I say, there's a few stories in the book about things like this, but. I basically had a shot when he felt I should have passed to him. And he spoke to me uh, loudly and berated me and I didn't respond very well. And, and quite rightly, I was substituted because of it. So uh, there was no um, afters with it. You know, we, we sat down and talked and I apologised. Uh, 
And he said, look, I'm young, I'm young. I've got to curb my enthusiasm and my temper, which is true. Um, and from then on, the rest is history because, you know, um, he's such a nice guy. I mean, that's what people should understand. It wasn't just on the field with Pele. He was, he was so approachable um, all times. Um, so we put it behind us and we went on to, to forge a, a really good understanding on the field. So I was so happy for him when he went, he went off on a high in the final. Well, and as you said in your book, and, and I've seen in countless other books, right? I mean, everybody wanted a piece of Pele, right? I mean, he he, he yeah. mastered the uh, the art of uh, closing his eyes, even though he may not be sleeping to sort of <laughs> shut everything out, right? And um, but look, talking about pressure, I mean, you know, I, I pressure, I, I, relative, right? But but yeah, the last year and and you know, a championship and all that kind of stuff, and and you know, was the the beginning of the end. The seventy seven was. How about when? So t- let's stick with seventy seven for a minute. Um, the arrival of two other players. Uh, how were? Um, how did you sort of know about and or uh, 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 welcome and and integrate uh, people like both Franz Beckenbauer and Carlos Alberto? Arguably the uh, the last two pieces of the crown, I guess, if you will, to sort yeah. of get over that hump. I mean, because those, well, those are those are two yeah. gigantic names in and of yeah. themselves, and I'm sure Giorgio both loved and not necessarily did like you know uh, that the arrival <laughs> of those guys too. To be honest, I was still getting it, getting around my head that I was playing with Pele. And when somebody mentioned that Beckenbauer would, you know, Franz Beckenbauer would be joining, I, I thought this is unreal. I, I, you know, never in my wildest dreams would I, I'd be with World Cup cap- captains, winners, the greatest players in the world. And, and Franz joined and took us onto a, a different level. And then, of course, when Carlos came as well, um, <laughs> Well, I think that was the final piece in the jigsaw and Carlos steered us through those those later games in the playoffs and that and his calm head, uh, you know, it, it just uh, made everybody else feel confident. Um, you know, when you've got a backbone of Carlos Alberto, um, Franz Beckenbauer, Pele, Giorgio Canalia, well, you know, <laughs> you've got a chance, haven't you? T- tell me about the coaching change, though, in 77. You, you mentioned it, right? It just, it seemed yeah. to me, uh, mostly in retrospect, right? Not necessarily at the time, but um, the arrival of these great players, uh, including yourself, right, uh, from the very beginning, um, I guess the word I'm, I struggle for, I, let's call it tinkering, right? Um, it, it's it's pre- The fact that a coach, Gordon Bradley, is swapped out literally in the middle of the season when things are starting to gel and some of the pieces are coming into play. Yeah. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? I know you talk about it in the book. I don't want to sort of give it all away because people want to buy yeah. the book, of course, but yeah. um, that's got to be a little unnerving for a player, right? Who's not spent the first part of the season getting used to all these players and a few world stars added to the mix along the way. And then the coach changes. I mean, how the yeah. hell are you supposed to win a championship at the end of the season with all that? change i mean how do you how do you keep your head straight well obviously i was disappointed because um gordon had, you know gordon bradley and joe mallis had, had brought me to the cosmos so i had a, a close relationship with them and i enjoyed playing from both um um sadly they're both not with us now but at the time it, it was a shock but little rumblings you know little um in the background people talking it wasn't a total shock you know, we, we wasn't like blowing people away. Uh, but as you say, we, we did make a bit of a comeback and things started to gel a little bit. And that's when the change got made. Um, and of course, Eddie came in, Eddie Fermani. And once it was a different style, it was a different way of looking at things. And we went from strength to strength. So all credit to him. Yeah, very, very interesting. And to get put in a finer point on, I mean, July 7th of 77, that was, there were like six regular season games left in the postseason. I mean, I, talk about a, a bold move. And I guess if you look at the documentary, it seems like Mr. Canalia was somehow part of that, of that, that, that recipe. Uh, I'm sure who knows, right? The full story, but. Um, Absolutely. I, I certainly don't know the full story behind it, but. I know Giorgio and uh, Eddie were quite close at the time. <laughs> well, 77, right, was, and I want to get to the Warner thing uh, in a bit, but 1977, right, was this, nothing was, if you will, guaranteed. Uh, look, nothing in life is, but uh, this this was still a Cosmos team that really 
I mean, at the, you know, had won in 1972 back in a, if you will, even a previous era of the NASL um, yeah. that had all this, everything was seemingly in place or at least put in place during the middle of the season to kind of deliver what, uh, you know, I think Warner Communications and Steve Ross and everybody in the, in, in the, the Erdogan brothers wanted, which was essentially a championship, right? And yeah. that's what made the, 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 the playoff run certainly very exciting. But could you have imagined the way the soccer bowl 77 situation played out, especially not only for, for what ultimately transpired the Cosmos winning finally, but for you in particular, uh, we're talking about the final. We are talking yeah. about the final. Okay. Uh, it's, it was one of those days that I felt like I could do anything. Um, and you get those days, you know, everybody's just in life and um, whatever, whatever you do. Um, and that was one of those days. I, I honestly felt absolutely terrific. And I just expected to do well. I expected myself to do well. I was up for it. I was up for the team. I was up for Pele. I was up for Eddie. And obviously, things worked out pretty well. Um, what I must say is that game could have gone either way. Um, Seattle were a terrific side, different style to us, but terrific footballers. And, you know, we shaded it. So um, the rest is history. But it lives with me to this day. I'll, I'll never forget that day. So again, you, you describe it accurately in the book. And and one, even if you weren't a Cosmos fan or a soccer fan, must find that Soccer yeah. Bowl 77 footage. Um, and I, I'll never forget it. But, uh, you know, how did, you had essentially made a run and it was out for, it wasn't a goal kick, but, the, but Tony Chersky, the Seattle Sanders goalie, had the ball. And this is back at a time when, uh, it wasn't a timed sort of uh, release uh, measurement for goalkeepers. There was this, um, you know, the ability to uh, roll it and uh, sort of advance the ball a bit before uh, the, the goalie released it. Um, what was in your mind? I mean, you were essentially had you were off the field essentially after after the previous play. What? Where? How did the spark come into your mind that hey, you know, he might be worth he might be poachable, so to speak, in his uh, you know, uh, re uh, uh, entry of the of the ball into the game. Well, I mean, people like Pele, George Best, um, many players. Um, I'd studied them over the years, and they're always alert to ed- everything that's possible on a football pitch. So I always felt that you know, just keep an eye on things, even when you know, like in that situation, Tony unfortunately took his eye off the ball rolled it in a way that I thought I might have a chance and it increasingly became yes I am going to get a chance here Um, and he was opportunist and as I said those great players that I mentioned always used to do something like that and when I got the first touch on the ball uh, my my first priority was to get in front of Tony so that he couldn't get around and grab it so what what he did he grabbed me instead and we ended up you know in a heap inside the goal but there was like this uh, silence. Uh, I don't think people had understood what had happened, that it actually was a goal. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it had ever been seen before. So, uh, yeah, it, it'll go down his history as one of those uh, strange moments, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, but 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 uh, certainly dramatic and, and a very good lesson to any uh, fledgling player at the time, right? A young young kid yeah. like me watching the game, right? It's like you got to keep your literally and figuratively eye on the ball and and recognize yeah. that it's an it's a live ball and stuff. It may not have been the prettiest thing, but holy mackerel, what I mean, that's exactly what you're supposed to do when you're yeah. paid to score goals, if you will, and doesn't have to be pretty, but boy, it was hell of a dramatic and it certainly. You said it before. I think that game was a lot closer than most people in retrospect remember. I mean, I, I think you even, I think it recounts uh, near the end of the game, there was a a, 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 a shot that I, that Messing kind of made a, a standout save for that that almost tied it up again. Yeah. Um, I say it was an end-to-end game. Um, both uh, teams had that turf, that turf though. My goodness. Oh, I know. It, it, it wasn't the best, but uh, you have to put that to the back of your mind and just produce what you can on it. Um, but it, it, it worked out well. Um, they came back strong and, and got the equaliser and it, it, it was anybody's game. But uh, I did feel as the game went on, we, we slowly 
decided to turn the screw and obviously managed to get the winner, which was uh, a terrific feeling. And I'll never forget that picture on the back of the uh, New York Daily News uh, the next day with, uh, I guess it was Pele, maybe Georgia. I don't know who was holding you up, but uh, you with your shoe, uh, which yes. had come off during the play. <clears throat> tell, uh, tell us, because I don't think it's ever been sort of really revealed. Did you score with the shoe that had the, the your foot with the shoe that was still on your foot or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's a good question. I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer that. I know that it was my left foot that touched the ball away from Tony Chersky, but I don't know which one came off. <laughs> I think we'll have to have a look at the picture to see which one. <laughs> and gee, I thought we were going to break some news almost 40 years later. Uh, all right. Well, let's. Uh, the, I don't. I don't want to keep you all day, Steve. But uh, a couple of thoughts about '78 um, and yeah. some of the other players that came into that mix. I think. Um, I mean, you mentioned this, uh, the uh, Jack Brand, right? Who I think is one of the greatest unsung North American Soccer League goalkeeper heroes. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people forget. I, I think you were there at the time. There was uh, this uh, sort of uh, a battle, I guess, uh, both on the field and maybe behind the scenes. Um, uh, once uh, 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 Shep was sold to Oakland the next yep. year between Jack Brand and Errol Yassine, um, yep. who interestingly was mentioned in the in the uh, programs as being from, quote unquote, Persia, um, which really <laughs> meant he was from Iran. And there was all it was very, very <laughs> delicate. Right. But um, there was a lot of drama there. I mean, I, I don't know Jack Brand wasn't necessarily he was kind of. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think management treated him extremely well. And there was a, either manufactured tension or real tension between them. It was always, there was drama in the goalkeeper spot that year, even though you were guys were, you were killing it. Well, they're, they're totally different goalkeepers, uh, personalities and the, the style. Um, Errol was a terrific goalkeeper and he, he had great presence. You know, he's a big guy, uh, big beard. He just looked a, a menacing presence in the box and any any cross he's gone into the box you knew Errol would you know soak him up um whereas uh, Jack was very very agile very on his toes um didn't need the height um great fantastic shot stopper and I agree with you he was very underestimated yeah and, and we also can't forget David Bursich was uh, uh, crucial there too yeah. I just it was very interesting yeah. to sort of see and and obviously the Erdogans right um uh, maybe a, a moment or two about that because they're very instrumental in you um, coming back in 78 uh, and recognizing your value, shall we say, had increased. Um, maybe this is the opportunity to talk about the Erdogans, Steve Ross, and the Warner Communications thing. Uh, we even had um, um, uh, a discussion in a previous episode uh, with Steve Ferrone from the average white band, right? Which is the house yeah. band, if you will, with the Cosmos theme and stuff. I mean, yeah. what a circus. I mean, I, I'm sure it was a an interesting thing on the field and getting ready for games and stuff, but maybe a moment or two. You mentioned the, the I'm with the Cosmos, the Studio 54 thing, but yeah. how much, I mean, it feels to me like there was, a, it was, I want to call it a party scene, but th there's got to be an unreality component to all of that and and fun, but also a little weird, no? Yeah, I mean, Armit Ertigan was was perhaps my biggest ally. Um, he he knew how much I liked my my music, especially my rock music, um, and we we, we formed a, a good relationship. And he was very very kind. And obviously, when any kind of star w w was uh, coming into the changing room, he he introduced me. So you know, people like Mick Jagger, Peter Frampton. Um, so again. It, it, football uh, football's always been my love obviously but music is really up there with it so uh, it was terrific to meet all these people and as I say I wouldn't have had that opportunity if it wasn't for Armit um, it was a terrific guy um, so he was the one in the whole organisation that I kind of spoke most to yeah in many respects it was actually his idea to get this franchise in the first place and he convincing yeah. Steve Ross right um, how about Steve yeah. Ross I mean this was I mean, all the biographies kind of point to this was the Cosmos was uh, his essentially his North, his NFL football team that he wasn't able to get. Right. And he wanted yeah. he really wanted to make this thing a showcase and then some. What, would you argue yeah, that was a good thing, a bad thing? You know, I mean, did it did it go off the rails a couple? of? I mean, it just again, it just seemed the dynamic is to me just 
it was the it's it's entertainment right but um I don't know Mick Jagger in the locker room at the end of the game I mean if I didn't have a good game I'm not sure I want to talk to Peter Frampton per se right oh I would <laughs> okay fair enough but you don't get that definitely I'd want to speak to him <laughs> But 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 I, but I, you know what I mean though, right? I mean, you know, in terms of like yeah, game, and, and you know, it's like uh, okay, now I got to do the party thing, you know. I mean, the one uh, meeting that really stood out for me was the meeting of giants. Was when Muhammad Ali came into the changing room and met Pele, and I was like literally yards away, and I, I my jaw must have dropped because these two iconic world leaders, uh, hugging and you know talking to each other that was that was a fantastic moment so the what warner brothers did was was bring all these people in and i loved every minute of it i must admit win lose or draw i i, I wanted to be part of that i really enjoyed it all right let me uh let's just i want i don't want to uh, ignore and and let's just maybe we can round the corner here on on this um so much i could talk to you for hours um but i know you wouldn't want to do that but feel free feel free <laughs> <laughs> how many hours you got steve just kidding um so so okay explain to me though uh um the Erdogans in particular Amit. um uh, the, the dynamic between 77 and 78 you hinted at it before um was it uh, you were you were sold right by by Villa to the Cosmos, so you were still a Cosmos yeah. player. Was there yeah. a thought that you were gonna go back to England and find another team for '78, or go back into the English season, which had already been underway, or did you know you were gonna come back and you were just trying to maybe uh, <laughs> up your quality, so to speak, in terms of being compensated more fairly for all the stuff that you had done the previous season? I really, it was a 50-50 thing. When I was coming back on the plane after the 77 soccer ball, uh, they were, the, the rest of the team were going off on tour and I went back to England. Um, very homesick. You know, my wife especially was very homesick. So I had that in the back of my mind. Um, we just finished the season on a high and done everything possible to do it for Pele. So my mind was a little bit mixed. Um, but... What I would say is, during that period, Eddie Fermani on tour with the Cosmos was phoning me from all corners of the planet, telling me to come back. Uh, you know, he personally. I would. I would have too. <laughs> and uh, then I got a call off uh, Armit Ertigan saying he'd like me to go to a England international um, down at Wembley um, and have a chat about coming back. And I said, well. This was the same day as the game. And I said, well, I'll never get there in time. And true to uh, Warner Communication style, Armit sent a chauffeur-driven car for me and got me down to the game. And on that night, I'd made my mind up. You know, he, he, he was very kind, what he said. And uh, he persuaded me to, to come back. And I'm glad he did. <laughs> but, but it was clear that your, your, um, your status was, was more... Um... You were not a quote unquote young rookie uh, phenom no. anymore. You were you were an established no. star. You had made your you had made your bones with the fans and 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 on on the field, right? You were and and with an exclamation point with that soccer ball previously, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, in the seventy seven season, I, I didn't have a car. Uh, I was re relying on like people like Gary Edrington picking me up. You know, my release was uh, getting to training, uh, training enjoyment playing games, enjoyment, but the rest of it off the field with no transport. And we'd only just been married for one month, you know, so there was a lot of um, homesickness going on there. Um, whereas in the second year, we knew what to expect. Uh, I managed to get a car, a nice place to live. Everything just, you know, um, went up a notch or two. And it, we, it was a great season, 78. And when I think back of people like Dennis Stewart, uh, and Bogey, Vladislav Bogachevich, who was one of, one of my all-time favourite players. Another unsung guy, right? Oh, absolutely phenomenal player. What, what a player he was. Uh, you know, to, I, I loved playing with him. I really did like playing with, with Bogey. But then them two guys, again, elevated us to even another level. You know, and I, I learned hell of a lot off uh, Dennis because obviously he'd, he'd done it and got the T-shirt back in England. So... I knew one day I wanted to come back and prove myself in England uh, to see if I could get into the England team at all. Um, 
So I got the best of both, really. I, I, believe, I believe I was over in the States in the best two years that the club had had. And then I got back to England and did pretty well and managed to get in the England team. So, you know, looking back, no regrets. So uh, your, your move to Coventry in, in 78 after that second uh, season uh, with the Cosmos, how, how does that come about? Was that more you than the club or vice versa? Or, uh, you know, it would seem like you had two great seasons under the uh, under the New York thing. Was it really the tug of the of the heart of the heartstrings to go back and, and kind of truly, you know, hit yeah. it, in, it from, from home and, and, and prove yourself at the top tier in, in England? Again, it could have gone either way. I mean, I, I absolutely adored playing with the Cosmos. I really did. And obviously having another successful season would have helped me get a really good contract. But I'm, one, I'm just one of these guys that it was niggling me at the, the back of my mind. I, I wanted to prove myself back in England. You know, um, if I'd have played, I don't know, 100, 200 appearances before I joined the Cosmos, I might have felt differently. But uh, I'd only played seven appearances in, in the in the old Division One in England, so it was a challenge, and I, I took the challenge above earning more money. So uh, that's how it came about. Yeah, and and the homesickness thing could easily be solved that way too. Well, I look and a and a, and a an amazing career at, at Coventry for sure. I think you you were instrumental in helping them, what get to uh, to stay up or get up. I forgot the 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 situation they were in. Well, the thing is with Coventry that. They were always mid-table uh, or below. Um, so it was always a challenge. Every year was a challenge to, to stay in. As you, as you said, it wasn't a premiership then. It was Division 1. Um, and we managed to do that year in, year out. And that was, that was our challenge. So it, it was a good grounding. Um, I had six seasons there. Uh, we did manage to come back to the, play the Cosmos at Giant Stadium, which was another a, a great night i enjoyed I remember that. that game i was there oh was you great stuff uh, well it, and, and do you remember the <laughs> do you remember the uh the roar of the crowd when you were announced i did i did yeah i, I think there was a bit of a, a mutter as well of where where my hair had disappeared to because i thought it cut <laughs> but when i went back in was it 90 something for the reunion yes i was there for that too 93 i think it was yeah and the first thing Pele said to me in the changing room was, where's your hair gone? <laughs> because I'd lost most of it by then. So that was a nice welcome, wasn't it? <laughs> well, so then tell me then about 82, right? So you came back yeah. essentially on loan, right? And I remember the NASL season was in the summer, right? So it was essentially off season for 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 England. Um, what were the circumstances around that? Um, were the Cosmos kind of trying to regain some past glory? Were you, were you kind of seeing if it was a scenario? I mean, how did that, how does a 1982 with the Cosmos come about? And by the way, were you, I forgot, were you uh, then contracted to spend, did you have to stay through the NASL season with the Cosmos before you went back to Coventry or did they get to recall you when their season started back up again? Um, basically our chairman at Coventry was Jimmy Hill. He did uh a bit of an input into the, just uh, a little yes yeah just a little bit uh, so it was done through him and the cosmos um he asked me if i fancied it and i jumped at it um and looking back it was um I, it wasn't the same the 82 season it wasn't the same yeah like, I, 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 let, me, let me stop you there because i really that's really what i want to get to is what was different about it um I, I, I felt the spark had gone. I really felt the spark had gone out of the league. Um, yes, the Cosmos was still the Cosmos, uh, but the the, uh, the attendances had fell. I don't know. Um, Pelly had stopped, obviously, years earlier, and there was a lack of the superstars, the real superstars in the game. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I enjoyed my, my season. But looking back what the, the mistake I made was, and you talked about it earlier, about uh, the current crop of players complaining about playing twice a week. Well, I played the Coventry season, then went to the States, played the state season, then come back and played the Coventry season. And I played 115 games consecutively. And I was just 
dead on the feet, you know, so that was a mistake. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, I, I think that's lost on folks who um, don't recognize that some of some players were indeed playing the NASL yeah. uh, in between seasons. And, and it really was kind of an endless treadmill, right? Yeah, I, I felt like I was treading water in the end. It, it, I was absolutely um, shattered. Uh, by the time I got back to the Coventry season, you know, my form was dipping because I just never had the energy. Uh, you think you can do it. Um, you know, you think you're young enough to, you, to do it, but you need a rest. And um, yeah, it took a lot out of me. And I, I honestly believe that's probably why my knee eventually gave way. As you mentioned, the energy thing. So 82, obviously still a um, um, uh, a championship season, right? Not, not uh, yeah. to be uh, uh, underestimated for sure. And still, you know, a bit of it, but yeah. Um, any particular things that you thought uh, were um, lacking or, I mean, there's sort of the, you know, you, you can't go home again per se, right? I mean, this wasn't your home, but it was certainly a, a period of time. Um, yeah. I, I think though, if I'm not mistaken, the 1982 NASL season was the first where some of the rule changes that you had experienced in 77 and 78 were no longer there. Um, like I think the 35 yard line had been, yeah, uh, pulled back, and and the, that was part of the whole politics because I think the U.S. was trying to get the World Cup in '86, so they really yeah. wanted to be in FIFA's good graces. I wonder. Yeah. I, I have this theory that I, there are many reasons why the NASL failed. And end yeah. of statement. But I think one of the sort of undersung ones is the the game. They had to roll back some of these rules that made it kind of exciting too. Uh, and that 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 thirty five yard line recall, uh, re, re, recall um, I think was certainly one of them. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I think one thing it did for me though that eighty two season, just going back to it, it um, I realised I could play in midfield, <laughs> and obviously I, that's how I ended up playing in in England. I I, I moved back into a left side of midfield or central midfield, so that's what that. Um, uh, the Professor Mazze uh, put me in there for a couple of games and I thought I did pr really well. Um, and it, it kind of put it in my mind that, OK, I, I don't have to have all this pace out on the on the wing anymore. I can play elsewhere. And that, that's what materialised when I came back to England, that uh, you know, I was put into midfield. So that's what I, I took from uh, that season with the Cosmos in 82. Very, very interesting. And and when you went back uh, for good um, after that, um, what was your thinking? What was your feeling about uh, the future of the Cosmos and the North American Soccer League? Did you did you think that this was sort of starting to falter, or did you think this was just sort of a, a kind of a I don't know a a, a, a bit of a, a a sag of sorts that would sort itself out or, or did you have any memories of what you thought you were leaving for the second time? Um, you know, I, I think most people sort of said it didn't feel the same like it was earlier on. No, it, it, it wasn't the same. Um, the television side of things had dwindled as well. You know, it wasn't get the publicity it should. I, it just, I, I can't really nail it. What it, you know, is an accumulation of things, but to play in the final in San Diego in front of so few people was uh, really disappointing, you know. Um, I know that the, the final has to be moved around the country quite rightly, but uh, I'd rather them give all the schools free tickets or something and let the kids come and watch just to get some atmosphere in there. So th that was disappointing. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was a great experience again to go back and they made me feel very welcome. Um, George, I was still banging in the goals, which was great to see. Uh, and the guy, um, Johan Nieskins, that was an eye opener playing with him. Uh, Bogey was still there, but there, there was just, the, the spark had gone out of the game, it really had gone out of the game, unfortunately. So, I, let's maybe wrap up with this then. And, and I, obviously, you, you know, gone on to uh, a, a stellar career uh, thereafter in England, obviously, uh, still well regarded, regardless of your surname um, <laughs> in many circles, right? Um, and it's been a, a, a sheer delight to, to, to reminisce with you and, and, and talk with you about your Cosmos years. But maybe, maybe kind of just to encapsulate, um, uh, you know, there is this. I, I, 
nostalgia is certainly an interesting thing, right? And we can't all live in that. But um, no. it's very interesting that uh, this Cosmos name and brand, even though there is now really no team yet, uh, now uh, there there are rumblings about it being again revived uh, at a at a lower tier level in the United States, and but it's still a very for a team that doesn't exist, if you will, the brand yeah. and the logo and the um just the the sheer power and force of the memories of the arguably maybe first super team, right? which is yeah. kind of understood now more regularly, um, doesn't dissipate one bit, right? You mentioned no. the name Cosmos, the, the fact that it's in the title of your book, right? People remember, and it has an aura to it. Um, yeah. Do, do you, I mean, when you look back on all that, I mean, do you, was it truly this sort of once in a lifetime kind of thing? I mean, I, I obviously I'm biased, right? And maybe you are too, because of your, your, your role in it, but um, it's a very interesting phenomenon. You can have a Cosmos, you know, T-shirt in various parts of the of the world, and people will know, or at least have an understanding of what that means. I, I still see people over here in England with with Cosmos T-shirts, uh, even to this day. Um, you know, if you, especially London, walk around London, you're bound to see at least one. It, it's incredible, really, as you say. The brand is just there for good. Um, I'd love to see them in the MSL, you know, I'd love to see them, you know, a rebirth so that it wasn't once in a lifetime, you know, perhaps there is another lifetime for them. Um, whether it'll happen, I don't know, but uh, if ever it did, I'll be first to come and watch, definitely. So that leads me, I guess, to my last question. Where do you think the uh, the state of the game is both globally, and we hinted at maybe some of your, your thoughts, uh, but also in the United States, uh, you know, Major League Soccer is, God bless it, 25 years old, um, you know, soccer specific stadiums, uh, uh, you know, the Euro snobs here, right, will always say, oh, it's centrally controlled and it's not sort of top tier and we'd ever win the, you know, the uh, you look at the U.S. national team, we're still, you know, more of it. It's like, you know, um, but, you know, that said, we have more soccer on television than we know what to do with now. Right. Which is, yeah. and, and it is easily pun punching its way into the, the top four league uh, environment of this country. It's taken a long time to get there. Um, it's a vastly different world. Do you have, I mean, I got to think that you've got to have some sort of level of, of pride uh, and uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, satisfaction uh, that you were part of building those blocks and getting, you know, that sort of initial pro fan sort of interest in stuff. Wh where do you think the game is going? And, and do you take any pride in, in having uh, been part of the initial boom here in this country professionally? Oh, I definitely feel pride in it. I mean, as I, I mentioned earlier, especially the, uh, you know, the young kids at the time, the, the amount of, when we used to do soccer clinics, it was just, you know, booming. The, the amount of, uh, children that want to get involved with the game um uh, certainly the girls and the, the ladies soccer you know that they've proven to be world beaters and long may that continue um as far as the msl msl um i haven't seen a great amount of it but what i've seen i've been been impressed with you know I, I, all credit to them you know it, it, they've been together a long time now there's a lot of people get a lot of sas satisfaction out of it it looks well supported Good luck to him. I hope it, uh, you know, keeps going for for a very, very long time. And how about the world game and and the Super League and all this kind of stuff? I mean, are we oh. going a bridge too far, or or is the game still strong? Or I, I you know, I, I have my doubts sometimes about the money uh, yeah. and the the cynicism of some of the play. And and you know, I I could see some improvements that maybe the NASL arguably. Uh, could be uh, uh, referred to for maybe some of those, but that's just me. Yeah. Um, let's put it this way. Since I retired, which was 1987, how many games do you think I've been to watch? <laughs> I'll, I'll put you out in misery. One. Interesting. One game since 1987. Because all I've seen was a deterioration of the person in the street being able to be close to the, the players and associate the game with the cells, just stripped away. It, it's became money orientated. Uh, I don't like it one bit. I, I think it should be given back to the supporters. 
Um, don't get me wrong, there's some fantastic teams out there, fantastic players, but everything revolves around the money side of things and it doesn't interest me in one bit. That's interesting and 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 kind of a sad statement, frankly, right? Because uh, I, but I but I agree with it, uh, and um, and I but I think it's creeping into sports generally, not just soccer, but but you know the, here in the states with the NFL football, right? American football, yeah. You know, I it's um, what 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 cities have to go through to get stadiums to keep their teams from leaving and the money, but the television and all that. I, you know, and now, now that the United States has legalized essentially gambling and sports, gee, what could yeah. go wrong there? Um, <laughs> I mean, can you, I don't know, yeah. I don't know, Steve. Can you imagine having play, you know, when you were playing that, and having people bet on you and your and your teams and your games and stuff? I mean, yeah. we haven't. I mean, I know it's been more of a thing in 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 the UK and and Europe for for some time, but I I, I just I think that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if we ever come back from that. And no. I just know something you know something scandalous is going to happen eventually in that. Yeah, I agree. Soccer, football, whatever we call it, it should be just about that. And it's always been a fan's game. That's the way I look at it. You know, the person in the street, the, the one that works in the factory five, six days a week and he, he's um, released, he's going to watch his favourite team on a Saturday and feels part of it, feels part of the family. That's gone. That's completely gone, and I, I, I just, I, I just don't get it. So, um, how long they can continue like it? Who knows? I've just uh, read today that one of my favourite players, who's playing for Villa, Jack Grealish, has been offered uh, Man City have offered a hundred million pounds for him. You know, it, it's just ridiculous amounts of money for people now. Yeah, I think I think the la- last point of that is uh, I think we're seeing a model now evolve in Man City, uh, probably sort of at the um, at the uh, well, apex. There's, there's, like a, there's a Super League within the Premier League anyway. Well, you sure, know, but but there's but, only six teams that can win it anyway. No, but it's also but it's also this sort of internationalization of brand, right? Man City, right, with a, a franchise in New York and MLS and in Australia yes. and yeah. Red Bull and and you know I think you're seeing sort of this. Um, I don't know, this sort of international franchise model, which I I don't yeah. necessarily feel comfortable about either, because you're no. you're taking the domesticity out of the leagues and uh, making absolutely. it sort of a national brand that you're you're flag planting in, right? I I don't know. Uh, absolutely, one hundred percent. Just the the, the lo- local support. Um, how that certainly in England, I, I don't know how the the average person um, manages to afford to go to games now. The prices they charge, you know. Um, I, 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 as I say, it, it's really disappointing. Uh, how long they can sustain it, I don't know. But um, and the, the other thing is, uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier about having three American players on the pitch, I'd love to see that over here now. Having three English players on the pitch, <laughs> isn't you that know? ironic? Yes, it is, isn't it? You know, I, I, it should be about your local players and you know there's nothing better from a, a local player playing for his local team um, and that's being took away now well it has been a joy the great uh steve evans also known yeah. as the great <laughs> steve hunt depending on your era of uh, of knowing his uh, his prowess on the field and off of it um this has been uh I, I appreciate your indulging me for now almost an hour and a half uh and i'm sorry to be too fanboy about it but um it's been a real pleasure. I, 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 you know, having been a fan from the, from back in the day and uh, uh, many memories uh, uh, delivered and um, uh, just, you know, uh, you were, uh, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only um, fan of uh, the old cosmos that uh, feels that way. So I, I look very much forward to getting this episode out because I know uh, our soccer uh, audience will uh, just, just devour it and uh, feel very similarly. Well, it's been a ple- pleasure, Tim. It really has. Really enjoyed our chat. And so hello to everybody in the States, all the NASL um, supporters. <laughs> all right. Mighty, mighty thanks to Steve. Thank you for taking time. And um, uh, I highly encourage the uh, autobiography Uh, which, depending on when and where you're listening, is either available immediately right now, that's uh, especially if you're in the UK, or uh, for pre-order, 
Uh, and you know how those dates sort of move up and stuff. So, uh, you know, you get in now and sometimes you get surprised with an earlier delivery, uh, say in the States or perhaps you're listening, say, come September or so of this episode or early October. Uh, the book is called I'm With the Cosmos, the story of Steve Hunt. It is uh, published by our pals at Pitch Publishing. Uh, you can find it wherever uh, good books are found or pre-orderable. Uh, we encourage, of course, you to do that uh, from our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, just search up our little episode here, number 226, with Stevie Hunt, and um, you can order from the link there. That'll give us a couple of shekels of uh, of referral love. We appreciate that. It helps keep our lights on. Uh, but, you know, however you get the book, uh, you know, just get it because it's, it's a fantastic ride. Some great pictures in there, some I've never seen before, uh, including a lot of detailed uh, shots of... Uh, that very famous uh, first goal in that Soccer Bowl 77 that we talked about. Um, I'm with the Cosmos, the story of Steve Hunt. It's a great read. You'll enjoy it, especially uh, if uh, you grew up uh, or were aware of the Cosmos story. And uh, hopefully uh, another chance maybe to, to talk to Steve in the future. Maybe he'll come uh, to the States in a couple of months, maybe uh, somehow to promote the book or whatever. It'd be just great to any any Cosmos people and stories where, you know, we're we're, we're front in the line uh, uh, of that and uh, uh, hopefully look forward to uh, to pursuing and having more of those conversations to come. Uh, let's see. While you're on GoodSeatStillAvailable.com, why don't you tool around and take a look at all those other episodes, the dozens and dozens and dozens of other episodes that we've done. And we'll continue to post them there, too. It's just a convenient place, for God's sakes. You can search them up. Uh, you got a keyword, a sport, a team you think we might have covered. Uh, you wonder if we've talked about uh, by all means, at the, the search bar right there on the site. So that's all there for you. You can stream them, you can download them, you can share them with friends, lots of things you can do. Of course, the best way, though, to make sure that you get each and every episode is to subscribe or follow whatever the whatever the um, the verb is now, the action verb, uh, to uh, it, it make sure that you get notified in the various feeds that are up there, your podcast player, whatever, uh, that a new episode is coming. We usually drop them late Sunday night, uh, early Monday morning, Eastern Time, United States. Um, that's kind of our regular thing. A couple of special uh, episodes once in a while as events warrant. Uh, but that's, of course, the best way. Tell your friends uh, and uh, get them to subscribe too. Why don't you? We appreciate that, of course. And uh, again, uh, what else? Uh, our social media. Yeah, you can follow us there. We we try to be somewhat active each week, kind of, you know, a couple of little cool little images that uh, kind of support the story and, and maybe kind of hint at what we're going to be talking about uh, on uh, Twitter. That's probably the most uh, voluminous place that we uh, we publish to. Uh, we're at Good Seats Still. Uh, on Instagram, we do a daily sort of uh, posting there. That's uh, Good Seats Still Available. That's our little handle there. And on Facebook, we also post uh, fairly regularly as well. Uh, we're also there at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you can subscribe, if you'd like, to our weekly email newsletter. It's really just kind of a, a pre-cap, if you will. It's kind of what I like to call it, of uh, what each week's uh, coming episode is going to be. We just send those out uh, each weekend as well. Kind of give you a little bit of a head start for those to be early in the know about what we're going to be talking about. Maybe we'll expand that into something. There's so many stories about teams and leagues and stuff and, and even modern day stuff. Are the Buffalo Bills going to stay in Buffalo and move to Austin? I don't know. You know, we might have uh, a reason to create sort of a more timely, shall we say, newsletter uh, in addition to the podcast. But, uh, you know, there's only so much time in the day. And uh, unless we make some more bucks with this little effort, I don't know. If we can, but I'd like to do it, right? Um, and maybe that's something we can do. And perhaps you let me know if you're interested in, in getting that. Lord knows there's plenty of stories uh, and at leagues folding. I mean, I know National Pro Soft, uh, sorry, uh, National Pro, National Fast Pitch, National Pro Fast Pitch. There you go. Uh, the uh, women's uh, softball league just folded a couple of days ago, somewhat quietly. Uh, but yeah, there's never an end to these kinds of stories. And, you know, I, I, nobody's talking about them. So, you know, maybe us. But I digress. Um, what else? Uh, Jerry Payne. Oh, we can't uh, forget him, of course. He's uh, the guy that uh, does all the work behind the scenes. Uh, if there's any guy who works uh, uh, harder th this week, I don't I don't know who or every week for that matter. I don't know who that is, but uh, I'll uh, I'll I'll fight you on uh, whether that's Jerry Payne or not. Nice. It is. Uh, he does a, a great job. He never complains. Uh, maybe except we know, you know, pay him in time. Uh, but, uh, you know, Jerry Payne Audio Excellence. Uh, thank you, kind sir. Thank you for sticking with us for four plus years and um, and not saying no to our uh, increasingly ridiculous requests for editing uh, stuff, et cetera. We appreciate it. Uh, we also, of course, appreciate you for listening. Uh, we are not going to leave you hanging. Uh, any uh, chance we get to play the great Cosmos theme from the 
Don't call them the average white band. No, the Cosmic Highlanders. Check out that episode with Steve Ferrone. You'll understand why from about a year ago. But here it is in all its five plus minute glory, the Cosmos theme. Yes, let's clap ourselves away. And uh, thanks again for listening. And uh, we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. We love you. Please stay safe. Get your shots, mask up and uh, take care. Bye bye. Bye.